Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. At the end of February, talks broke down between Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Cairo fears the dam will restrict the Nile's water flow. Addis Ababa, meanwhile, says it is ready to soon start filling the dam. Harry Verhoeven has been closely following this Nile issue for many years, and he joins us today to talk with me about the politics of the current impasse. Harry, welcome to the podcast. Delighted to be joining you. So, uh, what do we know about the current status of the talks? Well, it's clear that there's been a very important breakdown in these uh, in these conversations that have been mediated by the by the U.S. Treasury, um, and that there's a breakdown in confidence both between the parties, but also between the between the mediator and and, and the parties. Um, some of this has to do with genuinely complicated technical details as to the filling of the reservoir behind the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. But all of this also, of course, goes back to domestic politics, domestic politics in the United States, domestic politics in, in Ethiopia, the position of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, and of course, domestic politics in, in, in Egypt, where General Sisi is under a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure from, from people back home, especially nationalist factions, not to, to concede too much, but at the same time to stay close to the, um, to the US. And so that's why in, in many ways, these, these talks have, have broken down. They will, they will resume because I think all parties have a, have a stake in continuing that conversation. Uh, but it is bad news, both, um, both in, the, in the short term, but also potentially in terms of the, the longer term implications for the Nile and the missed opportunities that may result, uh, that, may, that may be a result of this. So can you walk us through the technical issues that would need to be solved in filling such a massive dam over many years? given the needs of downstream countries and variable rainfall? Right, indeed. I mean, dams are, are notoriously complex in terms, of, in terms of infrastructure, of course, and there's an extraordinary amount of assumptions that go into both the construction of a dam, then the filling of the dam, and then the operating of the dam. And these are, are three different but interrelated issues. So the question of construction, filling, and the actual operations of the dam. Now, there's still some questions that Egypt continues to have about, about safety of the dam. And that goes back to the, to the controversy that we've seen over the last um, 12 to, to, to 18 months now, especially in Ethiopia, where because of the growing um, competition between Abiy Ahmed and, and, of course, the TP11, the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, which used to be the dominant faction of the ruling party in, in Addis Ababa, the dam itself and the construction of the dam has become heavily politicized. And the accusations that the prime minister has made, both vis-a-vis the, the, the civil administrators constructing the dam, but also, of course, vis-a-vis METEC, the, the military industrial conglomerate that was supposed to provide turbines, as well as a number of other consultancy services, that has resulted in a drop in confidence, both in Egypt and Sudan, in Ethiopia's repeated promises that this dam will be safe, that they know what they're doing, that there is no risk of a of a collapse or a shutting down or any other any other glitches. And and you understand, of course, that that's a, a genuine and important issue to to discuss. Um, the second problem, as I said, is to do with the with the filling of the dam itself. And that has to do with how quickly do you fill that that reservoir behind the behind the GERD. Um, one option is to do it very, very quickly, which is, of course, the preference of, of Ethiopia. The quicker you fill it, the more quickly it can begin to, to operate, can begin to generate power, which is the primary function of this, of this dam. But of course, if you do want to fill it quickly, meaning that you don't let w- Nile water flow, um, flow through, it does mean, of course, that for those who are downstream, the Sudanese and the Egyptians, that there will probably be periods in which there's l- less water potentially much less water available for a certain period of time. So there's a there's a trade-off to be to be struck here and there's still um, discussions about you know how long should that period be? Should it be four years? Should it be seven years? What's the baseline year from which we calculate what an average flow of water would be? Um, and then third and 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 finally, as I said, it, it is about the operation of the dam. So once we've we've agreed on on the design of the dam, on its safety features, and once we've agreed on on how to fill it, how do we operate it? How do we decide how much water to let through in a, in a given year? Um, how much? How full should the reservoir be? You mentioned climate change. How would that in you know a bad year or a good year? How would that impact the operation of the dam? Um, and there again, there's a number of, of very important discussions still to be had, where where the parties have at some points come quite close to reaching agreement, and other times have have walked away again from uh, from what could have been a, a decent compromise. Yeah, and so uh, those are the technical issues. Um, and then and then beyond that, you you know, at a very high level, 
You have Egypt, which has very legitimate concerns about its own water security issues. And then Ethiopia, meanwhile, has invested heavily in the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Um, and it, millions of its citizens have even contributed uh, directly financially to the dam. Um, and also Ethiopia just understandably, I think, bristles at uh, you know this 70-year-old treaty in which it was not a party to that apportioned all these Nile water rights uh, to only two downstream countries. So, so you have these technical issues, which I think sound resolvable. Um, but I imagine it's in many ways these larger issues that that's really proving to be the very large barrier to, to moving this forward. Is that is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. I mean, the, the technical issues are are real issues of of safety, of filling, of of operation of them, but. If you put good technical people in a room, they are solvable. Uh, that's not really the, the stumbling block. The, what, what is really at stake, as you as you rightly hint at, are the different understandings of of security and and power. And this dam, of course, from the moment it was it was conceived and then launched, was explicitly meant to redraw the geopolitical fault lines um, in the um, in the Nile Basin, and were meant to shift the the center of gravity from Cairo, from Egypt. Um, to to Ethiopia, and that would be a, a highly significant move in, Ethi- in the Ethiopian nationalist imagination. It would reverse, as you rightly said, two centuries even of of humiliation of Egyptian imperialism and European imperialism, and all kinds of constraints on, e- on Ethiopia living up to its uh, its God given potential. And this dam is meant to kind of symbolically um, reverse that and to 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 change those flows. I mean, again, the name Renaissance is not is not coincidentally chosen. Eh? Hedesia in, in in Amarinia has very strong um, emotive connotations again to this idea of of rebirth of a, of a civilization that reassumes its its legitimate uh, its legitimate position in in history. Um, and of course, when when you talk in, in those kind of terms, you make it very often a, a zero sum game rather than a positive sum game, unfortunately. And there's a third country also at the table, which is Sudan, of course. Um, what is their position, and why did they not sign this agreement in DC? Well, Sudan is in a is in a tricky position. I mean, in in many ways, the, the Sudan the Sudan is also a key part in here, as you said, I mean, the, the, the Nile flows for most of its course through through Sudan. Most of the Nile water at any given moment in time is somewhere in Sudan. Um, so in that sense, you know, Sudan has a clearly huge stake. There is no country that would be more positively or negatively affected by the uh, by the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam than, than Sudan because of where the GERD is situated, is essentially on the Sudanese-Ethiopian um, Sudanese Ethiopian border. And so Sudan has, has, has tried to be very cautious and in many ways has tried to act as a kind of intermediary, historically, of course, an ally of Egypt. Uh, some would even say uh, mockingly kind of the uh, a vassal state of, uh, of Egypt for, for very long, at least till the 1980s. But then, of course, in the last five to 10 years, as, as the Sudanese political leadership understood that um, Egypt had, had declined in relative terms, Ethiopia has become a lot more important in the Horn of Africa and even beyond it. Um, Sudanese leadership has increasingly shifted in the direction of Addis Ababa, even endorsing the dam itself, which was quite, uh, quite the, the thing to do for um, for Amal Bashir and the people around him in in 2012. Um, and then the last couple of years, clearly, um, clearly engaging and looking with the Ethiopians and looking forward to the benefits of the dam, uh, without wanting to completely relinquish, of course, relations with with Egypt. So I think again. The fact that Sudan was was continued to say that it, it wants to these talks to to continue, uh, but that it was not quite ready to go as far as Egypt to say you know we, we're willing to sign this and and take the next step, uh, shows you the, the difficult position that the new transitional government in Khartoum is is in unable to to commit fully even if they would really like to do so. Interesting. So, of course, it's uh, it's somewhat striking that these talks are taking place in Washington. Um, for a long time, this issue really lacked a, a forum, you know, that, that the, the main parties agreed upon. Um, how did the Trump administration end up convening these talks? And also, why is it the Treasury Department and, and you know, not the State Department, as one would presume would take the lead on this within the U.S. administration? I don't think anyone fully has, has, has the full picture quite yet. But strikingly, as you said, it's it's actually under the Trump administration, uh, perhaps because of the the assumed or the real trust between Cairo and, and Washington that this decision was taken. And strikingly, it was, it's not been the State Department or um, or any other forum, but the, but the U.S. Treasury that's been put in charge here. 
Um, now, again, as I said, it's difficult to ascertain what exactly the reasons are. It's a controversial move in, in Washington itself. Many people see it as a kind of um, sign of the deeper distrust, of course, that we have in the Trump administration vis-a-vis -vis the, the career diplomats in the State Department, people who've been following these these countries and this dossier for, for quite a long time. That may well be, be the case. There's others who, who speculate that the Treasury, because of the links with the World Bank and because of the importance of, 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 of money and and perhaps the, the role that external finance could play in in lubricating a deal, that might have been the reason why they were why they were put in charge. It certainly doesn't seem to be a case, of course, of, of, of having picked the institution that has the most intuitive feel or the most intuitive understanding of either those countries or of the of the Nile uh, itself. So I imagine possibly from Addis Ababa's perspective, this looks like a case where Cairo might have reached out directly to Washington because of the close ties between those two capitals. And there might be concerns that the U.S. will not be a fair facilitator. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I, I've, I've heard that being said and, and being talked about. But the truth is, of course, that the, that the administration of Abiy Ahmed has also been very strongly supported from Washington and that, um, you know, the U.S. embassy in, in Addis Ababa, many people in the State Department were, were very, very critical of 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 the time when the TPLF dominated DPRDF up till two years ago, when when Abiy Ahmed became party chair and then uh, ultimately also also prime minister. So uh, this idea, so to speak, that you know the EPRDF is or, or the Prosperity Party now is not liked by by Washington and 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 the Egyptian government is I, I find too too simple an explanation. I think people in Addis Ababa know better than this. I would say rather than necessarily having anything to do with with the US mediation per se or the certain moves by the US Treasury there is a there's an internal dynamic here in Ethiopia um, that complicates things and it may make may, may, may seem that they that they blame everything on on the mediation while it may just be the the unwillingness or the inability of certain people in Addis to to sign or to meaningfully engage that really explains what we're seeing here and I I personally find this a great pity because you know, the way Ethiopia has handled the file of the Nile and the dam has, has shifted greatly in the last five to ten years. And I think there's been quite a few missed opportunities, both from an Ethiopian standpoint, but also from a, from a, a wider Nile Basin uh, standpoint. So what do we know about the deal that the U.S. wanted the parties to sign and that Egypt did sign here at the end of February in Washington, D.C., but Ethiopia and Sudan did not? Do we know... Uh, the time frame that it agreed upon for the water filling or how it addresses or doesn't address these historical water rights issues? Well, the truth is that we only know what has been said in, in, in public statements, of course, I mean, the very nature of negotiations and of the kind of documents that have been presented is that they remain confidential and, of course, in theory, only among among the parties. And, and you know, what we do know is, is of course, a number of statements from Egypt, um, Stressing how constructive what the America's put on the table has been, and and from the Ethiopian perspective, that uh, what has been presented recently is is backtracking and is a step back from 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 an earlier understanding. So again, it's it's difficult to see through the through the nationalist rhetoric here and and the the way in which the different parties are trying to frame this for their for their domestic audiences. Same thing with with Sudan. The Su Sudanese government knows that uh, the Sudanese people are perhaps less mobilized around this issue than in Egypt and. In Ethiopia, but they do know that it plays well with the Sudanese population in general to be seen as this kind of reconciler, this kind of bridge between the different, um, between the two different act actors. And then, um, of course, from an Ethiopian standpoint, as I said, there's this this, this increasing nationalism and the pressures that Abiy Ahmed is under and the way he has tried to politicize the dam, which I think says more is is more revealing of of what is really happening than the than the statements which, which, which seem to fault the, the United States. I haven't seen any indications in the conversations I have, including private conversations, that um, the U.S. has committed any major faux pas or has actually taken a side. So, so, so you referenced the sort of the backlash that occurred, I think, uh, that you saw very much play out in Ethiopian social media, for instance, um, uh, about the statement that came from the U.S. Treasury. And, of course, Egypt also then subsequently put out a statement where they use language suggesting that you know all means available might be used to protect its its um its 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 rights on this issue. Uh, can can we just talk a bit more about that statement because we we referenced it, but all the listeners might not know about the the fallout that occurred after these talks broke down. Sure, as I, as I said, I, I don't want to I don't want to overstate it just because I I think it's important that outsiders don't necessarily add to the acrimony and the emotion that is already in this in this conversation. And you know when. 
that doesn't really help, of course, anyone. I mean, um, I think it's been very clear for a very long time, and I've said this in many different forums, that there's not going to be a war between Egypt and Ethiopia. Egypt is not in a financial, not in a military, not in a political position, not even in a geographical position to actually do very much about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And the sooner we stop using this kind of language and also as outsiders speculating about prospects of conflict, which only makes things harder for the very good technical people who've been working very hard to bring the parties closer together, the sooner we stop doing that, the the better. Um, But really try to think in in a broader sense about how can this dam contribute to meeting the fundamental challenges of poverty reduction, environmental sustainability, augmenting agricultural productivity in the region and how can we not just talk about the dam but have a much broader conversation about the about the Nile Basin, which is initially what Ethiopia's objectives were. Initially, Ethiopia was was very keen to say this is not just about this dam. There's a much broader conversation to be had. I and many other people thought that was that was very constructive, that potentially also allowed Egypt to come on board in a in a in a, in a kind of comprehensive deal where everybody would do some uh, some give and take. Unfortunately, the talks have now been so narrowed on, on certain details to do with this dam that, I, as I said, we're, we're very deep in zero-sum in zero sum territory, and that makes it extremely difficult um, to, uh, to reach an agreement. Do you think this is a real impasse, or this is a period of posturing that the parties are likely to get past soon? Uh, difficult to say. I mean, it, 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 it could really be a, a temporary a temporary thing if, if the if the leaderships in Cairo and Addis Ababa and, as I said, to a lesser extent in Khartoum, decide that this issue is to be resolved and, and find a way, so that, as I said, that they allow everybody to communicate to their respective constituencies that this deal is good for the nation, this is good for the, for the country, for the region, that this will start a new era of, of, of regional cooperation and integration. Uh, then I see there's no reason why that why that couldn't happen. As I said, technicians have long figured out different ways of dealing with with many of the of the touchy issues that are on the table right now. The question is whether that is that is seen by President Sisi in Egypt and the people around him and Prime Minister Abiy and the people around him as at this moment in time the politically opportune thing to do. And unfortunately, both both leaders and both governments have been very much, I would argue, in in a ta- in tactical mode in the last couple of years, thinking about short term gains and short term losses and missing the bigger picture. And I, I referred that reference that earlier when I said that Ethiopia had really changed its a lot of its discourse and its efforts over the years, um, and that this dam has increasingly become a nationalist project rather than a regional project, as in initially a lot of the language was was all about, including by by Meles and those around him. Um, and that has, has brought us to this point where it could very well be a, a, an impasse that proves unresolvable because um, there just isn't the trust to, to, to sign anything meaningfully. And, and for example, some people in Egypt may calculate so saying, well, if, well, we know that if we don't sign Egypt, um, Ethiopia may go ahead and finish the dam. But at least we can say to the Egyptian people that we did not accept, had to concede any humiliating um any humiliating clauses or, or details that we don't want. And similarly, Ethiopia can say we, we prevail despite the obstructionism and the interference of, of outsiders. Um, but this is where, where we are, unfortunately. Do you think this is a case in which the as you as you make you know allusions to that a deal itself would might be the problem with both parties, or do you think it might be something more Fundamental also, in which Egypt wants to only sign a deal that reaffirms its, you know, what it views as its historic rights to the 55 billion cubic meters of water, whereas Ethiopia, of course, rejects signing any such deal. And this all hangs up on something, uh, you know, that ends up being uh, language, uh, more or less, rather than these technical details. Well, you're right. You know, at heart, it is about more fundamental things. I mean, there's a there's a very deep distrust in this region as a whole, in Sudan, but especially in Egypt and Ethiopia, um, to do with the concept of interdependence. Interdependence, which of course is often celebrated in, in liberal milieus as, as something that is that is positive, that mitigates or even, even prevents conflict, that brings people and societies and markets closer together. From the perspective of, of Nile Basin states, interdependence is a very dangerous thing. If you tell someone in the Ethiopian or Egyptian national security that they're going to depend on the other side... Um, for, for example, their export revenue from the perspective of Ethiopia or from the perspective of Egypt for, the, for, for water and therefore for agricultural production, this is a big, big no-no. And so, you know, you have to overcome this, this very deep legacy and this very deeply entrenched mode that interdependence, you know, depending on others, 
is dangerous and it's something that actually you'd rather not have any contact you you'd rather not engage even if it means of course that you miss out on a lot of potential economic or environmental benefits what was refreshing as i said when this dam was first launched is that it formed part of of a, of a much wider strategy of of regional integration, which was very convincingly articulated and advocated by the Ethiopian government, which is also why Egypt at that moment in time was was very much taken aback by it, was very surprised why there was a lot of international sympathy for what Ethiopia was saying and what it was doing. That has somewhat changed, as I said, as in the last couple of years, the discourse in Addis Ababa about the dam and about you know dams in general and regional integration has also has also shifted. And so um, we're, we're moving back again uh, in that sense, much much closer to that historical understanding of interdependence as as a liability, as something as something dangerous. And um, it shows you, of course, that that words do really do really matter, and that you know building trust is a is a very long and and painstaking process, and it can be squandered very quickly. And I'm I'm afraid that a lot of it has been squandered in the last couple of couple of months and last couple of years. Okay. So it seemed the decision by Ethiopia to shun these recent talks in Washington is in some ways meant to remind everyone that in many ways the dam is in their territory, so therefore they hold many of the cards in these negotiations. Egypt must be feeling increasingly desperate. Uh, Maybe that's fair or not. Um, But in theory, there's little preventing Ethiopia from moving ahead and soon starting to fill the dam except for outside pressure or in active war. So what do you think Egypt's approach will be moving ahead? The, the Egyptians have for years, of course, as I said earlier, as I referenced earlier, exerted informal pressure on the United States saying, well, you know, you really need to talk to your Ethiopian allies, your Ethiopian friends to to take our, our concerns more more seriously here. And you, you should stop essentially giving them a green light to to create facts on the ground. As you said, they, they hold so many of the cards. And, and as... The problem from the Egyptian perspective is that, you know, they should have really engaged much more strongly in five years ago or, or ten years ago um, with Ethiopia. When I, as I said, I think there was there was much there was a different political climate in Addis Ababa. There was much much more goodwill, um, and I think a, a much better chance of of reaching an agreement that, that ultimately would have taken e- Egyptian concerns really into 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 consideration. Um, I think. Egypt, in many ways, is still hoping, uh, or, or quietly hoping at least, that perhaps um, the dam will continue to suffer further delays. As you know, by now, the dam, in theory, should already have been been operating and functional. You know, Egypt is is hoping that just like in the past, in previous eras, where often Ethiopia had grand designs for 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 infrastructure on the Nile and and and, and in other parts of the country, that due to domestic instability, bureaucratic battles, and sometimes even civil war, these things fell apart. What I think they're missing, though, in 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 betting a bit on that option and hoping that this will will indeed um, strengthen their position as opposed to the Ethiopian position, is that it underestimates the degree to which, as I said, people like the prime minister and like the foreign minister find it useful to engage in nationalist rhetoric exactly because of those internal uh, political issues. It's a very difficult situation. Cairo doesn't have many cards to play with, and and what it's hoping for in many ways would not would not be very good either. So the the menu of options is essentially only between not 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 so great options. And of course, this is the Trump administration we're talking about. Um, so, do you think do you think Addis Ababa and Abi, you know, might need to worry about uh, escalating DC pressure on them, especially if Trump himself feels like uh, he's personally um, involved in these negotiations? Yeah, that, this is difficult to say because, as as you know, with the U.S. president, he he really is the wild card. I mean, he. We, we we think we understand how he how he sees Egypt and perhaps to some extent Ethiopia, but but do we really? It's completely possible that due to the intervention of one person or one particular conversation he has with a with a leader from the region, he completely changes his perspective or he thinks it's it's very much in his domestic interest to to push the issue in this way or in or in, in that way. So it's it's extremely difficult to say. Um, what is in any case very important, uh, certainly for the for the Ethiopians to note, is whereas again under the Obama administration they had very deep contacts with with many very senior people in in the White House and in in the State Department who who've known Ethiopia for a long time, known its leaders, understand it, sympathize at very very deep levels with the way it sees it sees the region. That is considerably less the case, of course, today under the Trump administration. So from 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 that perspective, um, people in Ethiopia. 
um, I think, um, as I referred to earlier, kind of missed their their moment a bit to 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 really uh, lock in the gains they've they've made and to to lock in a, a changed hydro political situation. Uh, do you think these U.S. based talks can still work as as a path? Um, and if not, you know, where does this all head? Well, I, I, first of all, I don't think we have many options um, beyond this. I don't think there's a there's any other third party that is that is better placed or, or or more trusted than the United States. I mean, there's there's been some talk at some point that there's a, an important role for the European Union or perhaps a, one of the member states of the European Union or uh, some kind of uh, non governmental mediator. And where it is, whereas it's true that that you may be able to find someone who is relatively trusted in both Addis and in in Cairo, the problem is that they don't necessarily bring bring a lot of political power to the table in the way, of course, that the United States does, especially also because of the deep security relationship that the United States has with Egypt and with Ethiopia, um, and and that that that's really quite important from the from the perspective of of those in the Nile Basin who. Who very much still think about military force and 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 um, and intelligence corporations as 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 the crucial variables in in international relations. So as I said, yeah, we're we're, we're stuck with this. Um, if there is p- real political will, Prime Minister of Ethiopia and the President of Egypt can make a deal here. I just don't see the the politics of this changing dramatically unless there's some kind of some 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 bizarre uh, turnaround that has to do with the. Uh, with the personalities involved, and as I, perhaps some intervention by by President Trump himself, but but all, other than that, I, I I really don't see it happening. Because even if you would get a temporary agreement, for example, that the Treasury gets the three parties to sign, how you get the much deeper trust and a much more fundamental political understanding on how to operate this dam and how to build a system of regional integration out of it, I I, I just don't see it don't see it working. All right, Harry. On that sobering note, I think we'll end it here. Thanks very much for coming on our podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for listening. You can find out more about Crisis Group and read our reports at crisisgroup.org or follow us on Twitter at Crisis Group. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell. This episode was produced by Mae Francis.